Hey everybody, my name is Yao Lim. I'm uh, one of the palliative care doctors at Bronson Hospital. Um, presenting today, uh, very humble, uh, grateful for you guys uh, for inviting me for the past several years to present this topic, delirium in palliative medicine. Um, can you see the screen change? Any, anyways, um, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, as we all know, there's no FDA approved medication for delirium. Uh, medication that are discussed during this lecture is considered off-label use uh, for treatment of delirium uh, based on our expert uh, recommendations in the field. Um, I try every year to, to share with um, my audiences and everybody in, in our field the latest information about evidence-based medicines. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I, I made some changes to the presentation this year. Um, so uh, compared to last year, you know, I added uh, a level of evidence, grades of recommendation for delirium. Um, so we can all know what is out there in terms of the evidence. So what is delirium? We use DSM-5 to define delirium um, as disturbances in attention and awareness, disturbances develop acutely that tends to fluctuate in severity. And uh, at least uh, one other additional uh, uh, incognition um, is noticed. Um, that are not in dementia, disturbance do not occur in context of severely reduced level of arousal or coma. Evidence of underlying organic causes. Um, <clears throat> so, what is the pathophysiology? Um, so, this uh, highlighted uh, diagram here: um, decrease in acetylcholine, increase in dopamine levels, store, uh, noradrenaline levels increase, serotonin levels increase, decrease in histamines. The overwhelming uh, change in the GABA receptors and uh, the cytokines uh, related to, for cancer patients, all those tend to um, disrupt the neurotransmitters in our cerebral uh, system, causing uh, global dysfunction um, that causes delirium. This picture tend to uh, highlight uh, what we just discussed about the chemical imbalances that causes delirium. Um, With the chemical imbalances in our CNS uh, during periods of extreme stress, it is not surprising that very frail patients with cancer uh, taking anticholinergic medications commonly results in inattentiveness and slowing of the EEG, which are cardinal findings in patients with delirium. Cytocholine is a neurotransmitter uh, involved in arousal, learning, memory, rapid eye movement, and sleep behavior. Um, thoughts, perceptions, and orientation. As the serum anticholinergic level decreases, symptoms of delirium improves. So why is uh, delirium important? Um, there's evidence to suggest, um, based on this article, that in an acute geriatric unit, 18% of patients admitted were found to have delirium. 24% uh, developed delirium after their admission. And uh, delirium, in comparison to non-delirious pinch patients, um, are more likely to have chronic impairment, severe acute illness, multiple comorbidities, uh, and functional disability uh, after their uh, delirious phase. Uh, delirium is a predictor of increased morbidity and mortality. The longer hospitalization causes, and patients are more likely to, to be discharged to a nursing facility when they're delirious. So delirium tend to be non-biased. They don't choose uh, between male and female, they're equal. Um, but the older the patient, the seriously ill patients tend to develop um, delirium. So it's no surprising that ICU patients uh, are more prone to delirium. Um, hospitalized patients, nursing home patients, um, There's more facts in delirium. 
Delirium patients, the median survival is 21 days versus 39 days in non-delirious patients. Um, surprisingly, depression and anxiety includes PTSD has been identified in recovered delirious patients. And another study found that, uh, interestingly, suicidal patients, 20% were found to have delirium. So ICU delirium is expensive. Um, and uh, 15 to 25,000 higher hospital costs and three times higher risk of death by six months and you know five fewer ventilator-free days and nine times higher incidence of cognitive impairment. So that's why delirium is an important topic. The pandemic, um, it was, uh, was interesting and hopefully we're out of the pandemic, but during the pandemic, this, um, uh, this slide was, uh, that we have here illustrates what we can actually do to help uh, reduce the stress of delirium in, in staff, patients, and family. Part of it, you know, is really supporting them, um, what we can do to help them. There's things that we can do to reduce stress, reorientation, family video conferencing, um, increase mobility, um, regular assessment of delirium, psychological support, uh, reassurance, you know. Um, anyways, let's move on. There's a lot to cover. Are there distress caused by delirium? Uh, the answer is yes. So this is an important slide because, um, you know, there are studies that suggest that um, in patients that are delirious, um, it's a very stressful situation for the family. Uh, the mean level of stress from a four-point scale is 3.75 five for the families, 3.2 for the patient, and three for the nurses. It's not surprising because um, when patients are um, delirious, they're moaning and uh, groaning, and a lot of those are perceived as uh, pain. And so families are very distressed, and patients tend to um, be very confused. Their perception of pain is altered. They are... Um, they can't really process information, so they are stressful as well. They graded at 3.2, and of course, nurses are being bugged by the patients and and nurse and family, and they're moaning, and so you know uh, they're they're the first ones that are being informed by the family and the patient about what's happening, and so they're in distress as well. So every, the healthcare system, everybody is in distress when somebody is delirious, especially hyperactive subtype. Um, so the the other study. Um, showed that two out of 34 patients did not remember the experience. So a lot of them after their delirium phase has uh, resolved, they tend to remember um, the situation that they were in. And um, they recall that as very distressful moment for them because they can't really process the information. And many family uh, felt that, you know, pain was the, the cause. So their opioids, um, Consumption tend to increase when they're in the delirious phase by eightfold. So, um, and these studies were done at MD Anderson. So, there's a relationship between pain and delirium. We discuss about that the moaning when they're delirious and um, perceived as uncontrolled pain. And so, their pain levels go, you, you, was perceived as much higher by the clinician. And so the distressful family calls the nurse, the nurse is distressed, they call the doctor, the doctor covering, you know, says, okay, yeah, yeah, let's just go up on the opioids and maybe this is pain because they're moaning. And so their opioid consumption increases um, by eight full during the study um, when they're in delirium. So there's a lot of etiology that may cause delirium as we all know. Um, you know, hypoxia, withdrawal symptoms, medications, that, which is iatrogenic, and a lot of things that are reversible too, um, electrolyte disturbances and stuff like that, infections that could be um, treated and reversible. We, those are important things that we have to identify. And the number of tests that we can actually do. The diagnosis of delirium um, requires a few things. You know, we, first we have to have a high index of suspicion um, that these patients are um, uh, about their, you know, that they're delirious. 
you know, and how do we do that? We, we compare the baseline assessment. If we can't figure out, you know, um, why are they behaving that the way they are? As simple as calling the family, calling the nursing home. What is the baseline mentation, you know? Since you're suspect, you know, find out the baseline and um, obtaining information from nurses are important because most of the time they spend much more uh, intimate time with the, the, with the patient than us. So there's several delirium subtypes, hyperactive, uh, hypoactive, mixed subtype, which is the most common type, um, normal conscious delirium. Are there any diagnostic tools? The answer is yes, there's a lot of diagnostic tools and things that we can actually use to uh, figure out um, if the patient is delirious or not. Um, you know, in research institutions, the MDAS or DRS uh, are used to assess uh, uh, delirium and they're used by psychiatrists, but more commonly, uh, you know, in the community setting and um, most practical, a convenient tool is to use a CAM assessment. And this is the CAM assessment. So basically you, you, you know, if the patient has an acute onset and there's a fluctuating course, which is course of, in, you know, which is hallmark, you know, and, and you add in attention to that, you know, uh, uh, when the patient's confused, then you need either C or D looking at this um, uh, CAM assessment. You add disorganized thinking or altered level of consciousness, there you have it. Um, you know, you can document that as CAM positive for delirium. So there is evidence, uh, the evidence is insufficient to recommend the routine use of screening tools in making a diagnosis of delirium in, in cancer patients. So, um, so take it as a you know, grain of salt. A lot of evidence base is lacking um, that, that we have in literature, but, you know, grading the, um, the recommendation is important and grade C here is really optional, but it does suggest that, you know, we, we, we don't use it, um, routinely, but if we suspect that the patient is delirious, we can always use uh, a screening tool to make sure that it is delirium. And in fact, what we, um, suspect, um, but we don't, we, it lacks evidence for daily routine use to, to assess delirium based on the evidence base that we have. Here's just a quick look at the clinical, fe clinical features comparing delirium and dementia because sometimes it can be um, confusing, um, but uh, you know, things that you have to remember, um, they are, there are similarities between delirium and dementia, impaired memory, impaired thinking, impaired judgment, but the hallmark is really um, fluctuating course of delirium and acute onset in delirium, and um, which is not present in dementia. And these are the differences that we discussed. An important feature is dementia is really um, a slow progressive decline, so they're irreversible most uh, of the time. Delirium is reversible. Um, most of the time they're reversible if the underlying cause is uh, able to be treated. So basically this highlights the important points here. The hypoactive delirious patients may have depressed mood and psychomotor retarda retardation, but cognitive impairment is not typically seen in depression. Um, however, depression cannot be diagnosed in a in the setting of acute delirium. So, if they're suspected to be de depression de depressed, and it has to be resolved, the delirium phase has to be resolved before you can de you know, um, diagnose somebody with depression. So this highlights poor outcomes in patients delirium when they're delirious. You know, they're, they tend to stop eating, stop drinking fluids. You know, they stop taking important medications. They may fall and injure themselves. Um, they're also more prone to being restrained, put on restraints, and and subsequently develop aspiration and develop pressure sores because of that. So that increase mortality. So 
the management of delirium. So this is the evidence-based part that I added um, from previous years. This recently in, in, in the pandemic, the, these um, were kind of uh, guidelines that they were developed um, from evidence-based medicine. So, so the most evidence-based in terms, so if you look at the, the, the grading here, uh, grade B suggests that, you know, it's really something that we can actually recommend doing to reverse the situation, but but uh, uh, unfortunately, it's it's lacking evidence in terms of uh, randomized trials. We don't have a lot of that. But to highlight this, um, level one and grade A recommendation is bisphosphonates. When somebody does have hypercalcemia and they they're very confused and delirious, it's completely reversible. It's it's a grade A recommendation that we use bisphosphonates for hypercalcemia. Um, you can use zolindronic acid, um, but uh, yeah, this great a recommendation would, would treat this because it's reversible. Opiate rotation in general is something that, um, you know, I've been incorporating in my practice a lot um, and found to be useful and it's recommended, although lack evidence, uh, lack randomized trial, um, but opiate rotation is appropriate when there's um, opiate induced neurotoxicity. Um, causing delirium, and you're suspecting that, or they're um, showing signs of um, urinary retention because of opioids that you started, or having, you know, um, uh, twitching of their muscles, and um, you know, those those can be caused by opioids. And opioid rotation to uh, a synthetic opioid like fentanyl and methadone from morphine is something that. Um, is suggested uh, that could help in those instances. Non-pharmacological management, you know, we, we all know that, you know, um, when somebody's delirious, you, you, you're, you're, you're not going to try to argue with them. There's no point, you know, but instead you want to keep them in a supportive uh, environment, you know, orient them frequently. Um, Put them in a quiet room, you know. Uh, try to treat them with respect. We talked about, you know, them being in the delirious phase still can remember the the what what scary moments that they have during that phase when they're recovered from it. So treat them with respect. They might remember, um, you know, avoid restraints, avoid unnecessary confrontation with them, and you know, try to educate the family. I think that's key as well. But in terms of the evidence base, um, you know, grade C is really optional. So for most non-pharmacological intervention for the prevention of delirium uh, in cancer patients, there's no research evidence which one uh, is to base on recommendation. So, so do it. You know, they don't have a lot of evidence base, but but um, also I think it's hard to uh, for our patient population being in palliative care especially cancer patients, to live long enough for a randomized controlled trial, and it's hard to conduct these studies. So um, I think as they con you know, continue to have the research um, studies going, so hopefully with time, uh, as, we are, as our field grow, we'll have more evidence base, but these are recommended to, um, as an optional thing that we should do. But we'll see the next slide. So hydration, IV fluids, there's limited research evidence for the role of a clinical assisted hydration and symptomatic management of delirium. So when somebody's delirious, you know, would hydration help? You know, it's optional. If you think that they're dehydrated, you know, um, yeah, just give it a try and think, you know, try to try to see if it's reversible or not. But it is lacking evidence. Again, it's hard to for us to, to you know, perform randomized trials in these uh, situations, um, it is optional and recommended by experts to 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 consider uh, magnesium replacement as well for hypomagnesemia. Clinical assisted hydration uh, is not more effective than placebo in preventing delirium. So, you know, just to when a patient is in the hospital, not eating, drinking, and they're very delirious you know, hydrating them is, you know, in these studies, uh, no different from a placebo. It might make the family feel better that, oh yeah, you're doing something, but, you know, uh, you know, from evidence-based, um, 
it is lacking. Um, you know, it's lacking in terms of being effective and in, in, in treating the delirium. So, uh, infections may cause delirium. You know, although it's um, it, although it's lacking evidence, but if there is a suspicious that suspicion that there's delirium you know, infection, treat it. You know, it's optional in terms of the guidelines, but of course, uh, um, medicine is is an art um, and we have to combine that with evidence base and when there's uh, suspicion for something that is treatable go ahead and do it and of course it depends on the patient's goals and their illness trajectory too when somebody is in the irreversible process of dying of course that's something that may not be helpful this is um, you know so medication or therapy withdrawal um, meaning taking away medicine in patients with delirium uh, related to anti-cancer treatments such as chemotherapy and immunotherapy. You know, when you suspect that chemotherapy is causing a lot of different problems or immunotherapy is causing the result of the delirium, you know, take it away. See how the patient does. Um, the discontinuation of uh, implicated medications, fluid restriction, and adequate oral salt intake is recommended for management of SIADH. And that's... Um, uh, that's something that is uh, can be considered and normally what we do, but just lack evidence, like I say. Um, so the hierarchy of delirium um, from uh, from how we treat the delirium normally when somebody's not uh, combative, they're just pleasantly confused. We always try our best to try to um, hydrate them you know it offer them food and drink and and treat them with respect and you know this this diagram illustrates that you know whenever they become uh very very confused and putting themselves at risk or staff at risk for harm then that's when we escalate uh treatments and usually we don't uh go go into the restraint unless they are really 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 combative um and, and refractory to medications There is no pharmacological, uh, no, no FDA approved for delirium uh, or agitation associated with delirium uh, treatments. Like I said, you know, there isn't a lot of um, guidelines to this, but evidence base suggests that, you know, if somebody is at risk for harming themselves, again, you know, you can, you can try to use Haldol and Haldol like medications. Um, or when you've tried everything you can, uh, non-pharmacological, and they're still um, very severe in agitation, that's time to treat. And what do you use to treat them? You can think about using antipsychotics as first line. Um, if antipsychotics are not helpful and the patient is going towards an irreversible causes of delirium, then benzodiazepines in combination of antipsychotics can be considered, and we'll talk about this. What about cholinesterase inhibitors? Um, no, that's that's something that we would not recommend. Um, management of delirium, pharmacological management. So although antipsychotic ag agents in the treatment of delirium is recommended by experts, like I discussed, there's no clear evidence um, that uh, supports its use. Um, in fact, if we look at the next slide, um, the consensus statement and guideline um, from the American Psychiatric Association and National Institute of Health and Care Excellence in the UK both support use of antipsychotic medication in, in certain instances for short duration of less than seven days. So. Um, the indication of use of antipsychotic is only when patients are in severe distress and, like I said, putting themselves at risk of harm or putting staff at risk for harm, that's when you use it, but, um, you know, uh, use it in, in short uh, duration, less than seven days is recommended. So Haldol is the most cost-effective um, use of uh, medication for delirium. Um, you can always consider um, Thorazine, which is chlorpromazine as a second line. Um, but do know 
both medications cause EPS side effects at any given rate. Doesn't it's not dose related. You know, you can give the lowest dose and they can have EPS side effects as well. Um, also note that they're QTC prolonging drugs as well. Um, so evidence base again, uh, drawing from um, the latest uh, data is that administration of either Haldol or Risperidone has no demonstrated benefit in the symptomatic management of mild to moderate delirium and is not recommended in this context. So mild to moderate, you know, try not to use uh, m medications unless it's severe. Like I said, uh, when somebody is presenting risk for harming self and harming staff, then then use it. Um, first and gen second generation antipsychotics have similar efficacy, but know that atypicals are more expensive. Um, that's in the past. Now it's um, more affordable. Um, in fact, um, olanzapine has gained a lot of um, uh, uh, use, uh, evidence based lately that for uh, other reasons besides um, um, delirium been used for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, um, improving insomnia, improving appetite. Um, in fact, the recent study for cancer cachexia uh, patients um, uh, in the rapid uh, uh, guideline change in 2023 just recently um, suggests use of olanzapine, which is Cyprexa. And so here we go. Administration of olanzapine may offer benefit. Um, we look at the evidence base, and olanzapine is uh, superior, it seems, compared to, in terms of evidence base compared to quetiapine or aripiprazole, um, but still it's an optional drug, um, a grade C. Why olanzapine? Because olanzapine has the least amount of QTC prolonging effects compared to other antipsychotic medications. EPS side effects is, is relatively low as well. Um, they help in, mo there's a multiple uh, uh, receptors that they innervate from olanzapine that helps with other things. You know, like I said in the past, like um, insomnia, it helps with um, improving appetite, improving nausea and vomiting related chemotherapy and stuff. So olanzapine is the highlight here. It's, in a lot of evidence. Um, do know that from this slide, quetiapine would be the safest medication to be used in patients with Lewy body dementia when they're delirious or patient with Parkinson's disease. Um, and those situations, you try to avoid medications like Haldol, uh, Thorazine, even uh, Risperidone because their EPS side effect is much, much higher and it could cause uh, uh, significant side effects in these patient population. You, you you essentially freeze them. And the antidote will be using like Benadryl medication or Benztropin to try to reverse that if that happens by accident. So is there a role for stimulant like methylphenidate? Um, yeah, so let's look at the evidence. Methylphenidate may improve cognition in hypoactive delirium in which neither delusional nor perception disturbances are present and for which no cause has been identified. So, so there is a role for methylphenidate. You can consider that. Um, evidence is lacking, but the great C recommendation by experts, so, um, so it's optional. So benzodiazepines in delirium, we try to avoid that, but only use it in certain, certain circumstances. If the patient has reason to suspect that benzo withdrawal or alcohol withdrawal is, is causing the delirium, then you know, benzodiazepines can be considered. Um, if the patient um, has uh, uh, has overwhelming refractory delirium, uh, refractory to using Haldol-like medications, it can be considered as well. But the last um, uh, brown font illustrate the evidence base. Um, uh, benzodiazepines are effective at providing sedation and potentially Angiolysis, angiolysis in the acute management of uh, severe symptomatic distress associated with delirium. So um, we'll talk about more about use of benzodiazepine at the end of life and, and uh, intractable delirium. But generally, you know, benzodiazepines, you try to avoid that in patients that um, are mild to moderate delirium, you know, because 
you know, benzodiazepines can precipitate delirium and cause worsening of delirium. So, like I said earlier, cholinesterase inhibitors, what are they? Um, rivastigmine, galantamine, donzepil, those are for patients with dementia. You don't use that for delirium. So, and randomized control trial, in fact, uh, it had to be stopped early in 2010 for rivastigmine group because it caused increased mortality. So, medication use of delirium, we talk about this. Um, we talk about the Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease. There is a role of using um, benzodiazepines in that situation if refractory to quetiapine or anolanzapine. So, keep that in mind that if, if with those situations, then maybe um, benzodiazepines can be considered. Um, So prevention of delirium is key. Um, you know, there's beers, the beers criteria that, you know, hope that we don't forget um, whenever there's um, delirium, we're looking through the, all the medication lists and see if there's anything that we can actually discontinue. Um, sometimes it's gonna be um, uh, gabapentinoid, sometimes it's gonna be benzodiazepines and other unnecessary medications that cross react with each other that could cause delirium. Sometimes it is opioids, and sometimes that needs to be rotated, as discussed uh, earlier. Uh, drugs to prevent delirium. Uh, melatonin and remelatonin, yeah, it helps improve sleep in certain patient population. Uh, and we do know that evidence base suggests that people that lack sleep tend to be more prone to delirium. Um, but are there any evidence with melatonin, remelatonin, and um, tryptophan that helps sleep that would prevent delirium? No, the evidence base is lacking, unfortunately. So this is an article that illustrates ICU patients' lack of sleep being delirious. That's to no surprise of all of us that sleep is very, very important. Otherwise, uh, lacking sleep, you know, um, the, the better the sleep quality in ICU patients, the less tendency that they're um, uh, going to be delirious, is what this article points out. So side effects. All medications come with side effects. Taking away medicines, like we discussed, um, can help in certain circumstances. This is the evidence base to support that with a grade B recommendation based on available evidence. This deep prescribing would be, appear to be worthwhile in older patients. Uh, many reasons, uh, although there is uh, insufficient data to support this recommendation for all cancer patients from the specific perspective of delirium prevention. So, um, take away medicines that, that could cause delirium. You know, also keep in mind that sometimes medications that can cause delirium, uh, including antibiotics like cefepime, if there's a reason to suspect delirium is caused by cefepime, maybe you know, there's a role of switching um, antibiotics to a different antibiotic that could be as effective uh, while, while be able to reverse um, potential delirium. Uh, let's see here. Drugs that may cause prolonged delirium. So again, Beer's criteria, and, and there are a lot of medications in that criteria. Um, Cefepime is in there, like we discussed. Um, let me move on to the other slide because there's so many slides that we have to go over. Anticholinergic medications. There is anticholinergic burden scale, and there's a scale um, later in this slide that you can actually use as well um, as a reference. Um, here's a slide that illustrates um, 2008 um, American um, Geriatric Society for Anticholinergics Activities and 107 medications commonly used by older adults that we don't know of, which includes clozapine, atropine, uh, amitriptyline, doxapine, hyoscyamine. Um, there's so many. Uh, chlorpromazine. So this is the scale that I was talking about, agingbrain.org, that you can actually use to, to see, you know, um, and there's a lot of drugs there uh, to see what what can um, what anticholinergic burden um, of these medications. 
So let's talk about terminal delirium. And this is this is the important topic is our specialty in, in palliative care and hospice care. This is something that sometimes are, are seen um, very commonly in the last few days to weeks of life. Um, delirium enters an irreversible phase where whatever you do um, is unable to improve the outcome. It's not reversible. Um, in which case, um, you know, educating family, um, letting them know, educating them, letting them know about the situation they're, that their loved ones are in, uh, reassurance um, are important. Um, if goals of care are not done, this is the time to be uh, doing it because uh, we do know that terminal delirium, um, once it's onset, you know, patients sometimes have very short time to live. So those symptoms that can be identified are, you know, patients that are really, really, really uh, hallucinating, seeing things that are not there. They're moaning, grimacing, get, trying to get out of bed, restlessness. Um, those are red flags. Um, try to avoid restraints, um, use medications, but again, um, try to educate the family and try to use as much as possible uh, uh, anything, you know, refraining from restraint if possible. But in the instances where you have to, if they're really presenting risk for themselves or the fam or, or your staff or their own family. So in that situation, then of course you, you're, you're you need to restrain them. But there are um, trials and, and, and evidence-based medicine that suggests that um, there's things that we can actually do to improve things. Um, in 2017, in JAMA article, um, you know, there's a, a article that suggests that lorazepam in addition to um, Haldol can, versus Haldol alone um, can actually help improve a delirious phase. And I've incorporated this in my practice. You know, usually I would do one milligram of lorazepam, one milligram of Haldol, or um, some of my colleagues would use um, lorazepam in combination with Seroquel or combination with Zyprexa. Um, so benzodiazepine with an antipsychotic agent um, could help improve delirium. Um, you can look at this from the trial, but the same uh, uh, people that conducted the trial, Dr. Hui and his team and NV Anderson also did a more recent um, study in 2020 for neuroleptic strategies for terminal agitation in patients with cancer and delirium at an acute palliative care unit, a single center double-blinded uh, parallel group randomized trial. In this, um, they recommend a trial of intravenous Aldol dose escalation at two milligrams every four hours for terminal agitation, agitation patients. Um, they also recommend uh, effectiveness and, and use of neuroleptic rotation to Thorazine uh, if Haldol is not helpful. And also they found that the combination of Haldol and Thorazine both together uh, could be as effective as well um, as dose escalation goes. Uh, that's something to consider, both combined. Aldo Thorazine. So I think this is a good illustration of terminal delirium, restlessness from normal, they become restless, become confused, tremulous, hallucinating, uh, myoclonic seizures, and slowly graduating, uh, gradually developing into an irreversible state where they become semi comatose, comatose, and de death. Um, but the difficult road. Um, is when they're hallucinating, when they're seeing things, when they're having jerks. That's when family uh, um, family needs the most support in educating uh, and, and letting them know and reassurance that that this is uh, the situation that their loved ones are are facing. And this is also a time when we need to discuss escalating uh, into uh, control um, sedation uh, for terminal delirium. So um, this is a diagram that essentially um, tells us that we need to keep uh, treating symptoms, but also keep 
uh, the goals of care and, and in mind and clarifying goals and having these um, end of life discussions when the terminal delirium is, 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 is there. Evidence base suggests that um, these are grade A recommendations, by the way. And while not all patients with cancer will develop delirium, we recommend that relatives have access to information about delirium at repeated intervals, especially if the patient's condition is declining due to disease progression. This information should also be disseminated to the wider family who are likely to visit. And this is this is easier said than done, right? Because in MD Anderson Cancer Center, where, where they where they do a lot of these um, studies, they're at an inpatient out of care unit where staff are trained, um, even the nursing staff um, are trained to discuss having these uh, uh, education to the family members, but in a community setting where patients are scattered and different floors, you know, some are in the orthopedic floor, some in the ICU, some are in the general medical unit. Sometimes it's tough, especially, you know, during the pandemic when we have so many change in staff, new nurses coming in, inexperienced nurses and staff. So, but still the grade A recommendation, we still need to try our very best in trying to educate staff but also tried to um, uh, to do our best in educating family and support them during this difficult time when their loved ones are so sick. Um, written information um, should also be supplemented with education and psychological support for family uh, by suitably trained staff. And this is also recommended as grade A, um, something to think about. So team effort, you know, like I discussed earlier, um, interprofessional delirium education um, should be a core component of an in, interprofessional unit or hospital-wide strategy to improve the recognition and assessment and management of delirium um, by the whole healthcare team. So educating our, ourselves and our colleagues are important. So this di diagram basically illustrates, um, um, you know, what we do in certain circumstances, treating hyperactive delirium, hypoactive delirium, and what we should do um, to help these patients. This is just a couple of diagrams I found interested and found to be helpful as a short guide. Anyways, uh, what time is it? 8.17. Uh, thank you very much for um, allowing me to present to you guys. Um, I hope this was helpful uh, in the discussion of delirium. I, you know, are there any questions or anything that that uh, any of you want to add to delirium? Um, well done, uh, uh, y'all. Thank you. I appreciate you doing that. If you want to go ahead and um, uh, stop the screen sharing, uh, then we can. Uh, open it up and see if folks have uh, questions or comments. Um, I guess just to kick it off, um, uh, your your comments uh, in, intermittently on restraints I thought was uh, was really appropriate, especially the last one. I, I think that uh, we 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 certainly are in a culture within our hospital systems where restraints are, um, in some cases, it's it, it feels like they're forbidden, and there are, are a lot of documentation issues that have to go into the use of restraints. Uh, and I think that there's a pendulum in some cases I've seen that has swung to where we never can use them under any circumstance. And as you pointed out at the end, and, and I just wanted to, to emphasize that, that there are circumstances in which restraints are necessary for the safety of patients and staff. And uh, we, we need to recognize that, identify that, and, and simply make sure that we're documenting appropriately, and then following the rules for how long you can do them and how long you uh, then uh, can uh, relieve them uh, from the restraints. But uh, I think that's uh, it's an important topic. Thank you. Other questions and uh, comments for uh, for Dr. Lim. Well, if not, I think we can go ahead and uh, transition to our uh, to our case for the, for the day.